And when you get old, it takes a little longer to walk from Colorado by the hall up here. It's because you're carrying a lot of water. Welcome all of you to the internship panel sponsored by the School of Public Affairs and the Arts and Criminal Justice Program. We are very, very fortunate today to have representatives from local, state, and federal agencies participating. Now, one of the key benefits, I think, of the ESCJ program is the fact that you all, the students, have to do an internship. For me, that's how I started my career. When I was in college, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to get into corrections. So I did an internship with uh, State Probation in Denver. And from that internship, the work that I did, the recognition that I got, I was able to apply for a position in Colorado Springs at the time. I haven't noticed anybody here in Colorado Springs, but because of the context that I made in Denver that had, again, the people down here in Springs, I was one of the main individuals applying and, again, able to get hired. From that, I went on to a federal career, worked with that for almost 23 years, retired as a uh, deputy chief of the federal probation office. So again, I think this opportunity that you have here today is extremely beneficial. We have, as I mentioned, local, state, and federal. For those of you that are going to do an internship outside of law enforcement, meaning outside of the Colorado Springs Police Department or outside of the El Paso County Sheriff's Department, I will oversee those internships. On our School of Public Affairs website is a link to the internship manual. So if you've not pulled up the internship manual, I encourage you to do that, to read through it. Also on that link are the application forms for the internship. If you are looking at doing an internship with CSPD or the Sheriff's Office, and unfortunately Catherine Richards couldn't be here today from the El Paso County Sheriff's Department, there's a link there also to additional forms that you'll fill out for the Sheriff's Office and the Police Department. Now, Mr. Rock Walker, who's in the back, he is going to oversee all of the internships for the Sheriff's Office and the Police Department. So if you have those, if you're interested in those, you'll go to Mr. Walker to see him. He'll get you involved in those. I'll do all the other internships. I'm not going to introduce all the panel members at this point. I'm going to ask them to, as they present, introduce themselves, give you a little background information on them and their careers and their internship program. And I'm going to turn it over to them. We've got a couple other participants that will show up a little later. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to Ray. fortunate enough to be here last year um, and this has been my first year at probation as a DBS which is the director of volunteer service. Uh, since then we've had some really quality people that have come through the program of probation and I have put a quick PowerPoint together and we had a few testimonials of people that have gone through the program and what they've gained from it and uh, Unfortunately, I didn't load the video correctly to the PowerPoint, and I'm not going to be able to play that for you. But uh, I can say that uh, we are in the hiring process right now, and we do have one of these former students that was here from UCCS that is interviewing for a job. It's a three-stage process, and she is currently uh, pursuing a, the job with probation. Uh, me, myself, I was a, uh, originally I was a manufacturer engineer uh, for Boeing and McDonnell Douglas and uh, the facility was moving to Alabama and I was ready for a change in my life. I was tired of working with numbers, I wanted to work with, with people. And I did have a friend that was a probation officer and she guided me into getting into an internship. Um, when I did get into an internship probation, I 
really did enjoy it. I found a passion for helping people, for uh, helping people with substance abuse, domestic violence, um, so on and so forth, helping them get their lives together, uh, re reuniting with their families, uh, helping them get on track with their careers, uh, education, so they can move forward. And also seeing them being intrinsic with their change and not coming back and being uh, productive members of society. And that's what's really hooked me into probation. Um, that being said, I'll go ahead and start with my PowerPoint. Send uh, the release of information and the application is with mine for the youth, for those who are interested in doing an internship with us. Uh, he has, uh, like I said, he has all the documents that you need. You can email them to me. Also, he does have my email address. So, if you are interested in doing an internship with us, uh, just get with Mike and he'll be able to help you out with that. that unfortunately didn't uh, load, but with probation, we are to help people before they get to a point where they have to be incarcerated in prison. It does cost about approximately $35,000 to house a person in, in prison, and for a person to be supervised on probation, it's $600, so there's quite a cost savings there. For people that are interested in coming over for an internship, uh, like I did mention earlier, there's a release of information that you'll have to sign, and we'll do a background check. Usually a background check takes approximately about two weeks. Sometimes we get them back sooner. Some of the responsibilities are working one-on-one -on -one with clients. Um, you'll be trained on how to deal with them, etiquette uh, as far as dealing with clients. Also, uh, appearing in court, uh, you'll be able to work with the public defenders, the, the district attorneys, also uh, private attorneys. Uh, it's quite an education and you, you will get a, an opportunity to do as much as you want in court. We do supervise adults. Uh, minimum, well, medium to minimum risk clients on the LSI, which is a risk assessment level. So most of the people that we're dealing with, they're pretty motivated in doing the right things. Uh, we're not gonna, our volunteers don't uh, deal with max clients. However, we do do some shadowing with ISP, uh, who are probation officers who uh, supervise intensive supervision clients. Also, if anybody's interested, uh, we have had some interns that have shadowed with the sex offender unit, and so on and so forth. And basically what we do is we just make sure that the clients that uh, are assigned to us really follow the court orders. And I just spoke earlier about how often we see them. That's based upon their risk level or on their needs, what, what, they, what their needs are in the community. The different uh, areas that you might be able to shadow, PSIs, which is a pre-sentence investigation. And that's done when a person's going through, their, going through the case before they're sentenced. A probation officer will take all the data, they'll interview them, they'll look at their case, they'll make a recommendation to the court. And from that recommendation, that will send to the judge, and usually the judge goes along with what the uh, PSI writer recommends. Uh, you'll have access to eclipse, data entry, basically everything that a regular probation officer will do. 
uh, you have the opportunity to do, to do that. We talked about assessments. Probation is really heavy on assessments. The LSI, the ASUS, uh, ASUS, trying to figure out how we can best uh, serve our clients, and that's through, through the assessments. Motivational interviewing is really big right now with probation and throughout the state, and that's basically giving our clients an opportunity to figure out what they need to do in life. Rather than being told to, we're kind of move, moving away from being punitive to being more of a support uh, for our clients. Also, there's uh, strategies for behavioral change, which is a program set up to reward clients when they do something right and when they are not acting appropriately, uh, we give them a sanction. The sanction would be pretty quick and swift. And through mo motivational interviewing too, it's a lot of the clients think of their own sanctions. And a lot of times their sanctions are a little bit harsher than what a probation officer would do. And once you do see that happen, you, you can see that they're invested and they're, they're really trying to make a change within themselves. A lot of probation officers have different degrees from different areas. Uh, I have my degree in soci uh, sociology, sociology, criminology. Uh, we have a lot of probation officers with different uh, majors. We do have some even probation officers that have business degrees and and whatnot. So you know, somebody that's interested in this can make a career change just like I did. Currently, we have about 23, 24 interns. Uh, a lot of our interns right now, our volunteers are moving on and, and getting employment. So if anybody's interested, it's a really good time to get in because we really have uh, some openings that we need to fill. There's a lot of different uh, cases that we do have there. Uh, you know, we have uh, DB, we have DB Specialty Court, DUI, uh, juvenile standard, drug offender court, uh, the sex offender unit, and also economic crime. What's neat about us at the Fort Judicial is that we do have uh, specialty courts, and there's been a lot of research and time that's been put into this, and through the research, they're showing that uh, a probation officer that has a smaller caseload and has more resources is able to get better success. When people get put in these specialty courts, they have had several failures. You know, for instance, somebody with a DUI, it might be their fifth or sixth DUI offense. And they keep going through the system and going through the programs. But with a smaller caseload, being more invested, and having the resource to help people, we are finding out that we're having an 86% success rate with people that have failed over and over and over. So it's a really neat program, and I think it's something that we can really showcase here at the Fourth Judicial. Fourth Judicial, uh, it's very unique here. And as I did state earlier, you know, the people that do help us out with the, the volunteer unit and internship are highly valued and, and very well respected throughout the community. Uh, you get a lot of great experience. Also, you get a lot of good network networking in with probation and with. Uh, the other, the other people that do help us. We did a quick survey uh, among other probation officers and about two thirds of our staff have been interns or have been volunteers. And what's really cool is our deputy chief, she was a, a volunteer and an intern uh, before she got in, so it's, it's, it's a neat uh, opportunity to, to get employment. And without the videos, that's pretty much what I have. Thank you.
Frankenstein, and I'm from the fourth judicial district of Frankenstein. Um, I want to thank Mike and all of you for coming today. Um, we have a really robust volunteer program. We probably run about 100 to 125 to 135 volunteers at any given time. Um, you're not just observing crime solving, but you're actually involved in it. You work with the victims sometimes. Um, it just depends on your interest of this. And what we like, the probation department, we also have hired many volunteers from our volunteer uh, pool um, that were interested in criminal justice. And so um, some of the things that we do is uh, we are working on active cases and solving them. We're listening to jail calls, which is a really interesting portion of what we do. We have people that are actually capturing information about people that are confessing to crimes they've committed, believe it or not. On the recorded calls, these are not like we're spying. These are people that said, I'm just sick of talking, and they're actually getting that. Um, we have 15 convictions that resulted from our volunteers that listened to them. We have also the domestic violence department where we have one paid staff person and the rest of it is manned and staffed by our volunteers. And those are the actual advocates. So we have quite a few from the University of Colorado. And we uh, really, that for us is a really great opportunity to reach out to people who need an opportunity to find out what do they want to do. We can't advise them, but we ask them a series of questions and we offer them opportunities in the community to tap into those resources. Um, we also have people that are working on administrative and working with legal assistance in our juvenile department. Um, some are actually working with juveniles in our program trying to help them get new ways to resolve conflict, new ways to think of drinking and driving. Um, we're not just about prosecution, which is what you don't read on the newspapers. Um, <clears throat> we're really trying to do a lot of restorative justice. We also have a program where we go out and teach children in our community, the fifth grade students, about what are you going to do if you find a gun in a field? What are you going to do if your student decides he says, I'm going to kill someone? But what are you going to do if someone says, I'm really depressed, I don't want to live anymore? Um, these are real life issues. Most of the kids I've sat in on these presentations, a lot of these kids will say, how many of you have iPhones? And they'll all raise their hands. Which, when you think, <clears throat> like 10 or 20 years ago, they don't have these capacities. But some of these kids are talking to people that are predators. And we're trying to help them avoid that consequence and that really negative situation. We have a great program. Um, I'd be very happy to talk to any of you about it. Um, I have some brochures. We have a great website. Um, we also have an economic crime department. If you love accounting and finance, you have some experience in that. Um, trying to see how economic crime issues are resolved. Um, I don't like them, but there are some interesting stories that happen with people that are home and that's around and they're incredibly Viruses to put up, if they could only use that in the direction of a good place. It's kind of like people that work with money in situations like that. Um, so, do you have any questions about some of the things that we're doing, or what can I answer for you about that? Are a lot of all of you are criminal justice students? What, what are some of the careers that you want to pursue? students that will come in, they want to work in either law enforcement, they want to come working in crime solving in some capacity, maybe FBI, yeah. other law enforcement, or they want to work in CIA, some of them um, are interested in working in um, paralegal positions. Um, there's just so many, such a variety of opportunities. Um, I'd be more than happy to talk to any brochures and any of our business cards if you have any questions. Thank you.
We are a federal law enforcement agency, but not the most well-known of the federal law enforcement agencies. Um, I think uh, my friends at uh, the FBI would call us a bunch of a bunch of cowboys um, because we we um, have a very wide-ranging uh, number of federal statutes that we enforce. Um, and essentially, it's, it involves anything that crosses the border with the United States, inbound or outbound. We, uh, we, our jurisdiction includes narcotic smuggling, money laundering, uh, uh, several different varieties of uh, federal level fraud to include marriage and benefit fraud, uh, document fraud, customs merchandise type frauds, uh, avoidance of duties, uh, intellectual property rights, <coughs> importation of counterfeit goods. Uh, my particular specialty is in international weapons trafficking, specifically uh, weapons exports. Uh, I was placed here, uh, my previous job was as a program manager at, at our headquarters in Washington, See, I was placed here in Colorado Springs to stem the th threat related to the export, the illegal export of licensable space technology to uh, foreign countries that we don't want to be able to take advantage of that particular level of high technology that's manufactured by U.S. manufacturers. Um, I, my particular job, I run an undercover uh, operation. Uh, in which we pose as essentially a weapons trafficker and we engage in criminal investigations against other weapons traffickers uh, around the world. Um, we also have jurisdiction over the money laundering statutes, child pornography, human trafficking. Um, the good thing about working for my agency um, is that you can do just about any of those that you want, whatever your interest is, um, you can, while you're in college, tailor your academic experience toward uh, a particular discipline in my agency. And uh, if your resume is, is up to snuff at the time, then we recruit new agents um, to come in and become federal agents, and you can then angle your sword yourself toward uh, a particular discipline. Like I said, I just happened to choose weapons trafficking because it seemed like a good thing to do. Um, let's see, with regard to our internship program, uh, we try to assign duties to interns that are commensurate with entry-level agents. Uh, in other words, uh, you would be issuing subpoenas. We have subpoena authority over immigration matters, customs matters, and uh, narcotic smuggling matters. Um, you would be acting as a, an analyst or a consultant to uh, an agent who is working real criminal federal cases. Um, in some cases, uh, where there's an established trust with the student, we're able to include you in, to be on site in search warrant locations, uh, be present during investigative interviews, um, uh, go out on surveillance with us. Um, but again, those are, those are in circumstances where we're able to establish that the student has a, a level of uh, professionalism that's exhibited. We don't have many internship positions. Uh, the main reason for that is because uh, the interns that come in actually do uh, occupy a, a spot on our table of organization, so you become uh, a, um, you become personnel pursuant to our uh, personnel regulations. Uh, our interns also have to pass a uh, limited uh, field background investigation. So if there's a criminal history in your past, um, you're probably not going to pass that and be able to get, uh, achieve the equivalent of a, uh, a 
military or a federal secret clearance. Um, again, my name is Greg Slavens, Homeland Security Investigations, uh, in the Colorado Springs office. My email address is scott.g.slavens, S-L-A-V-E-N-S, at ICE, I-C-E, dot D-H-S, dot G-O-V. Thanks for letting me be here.
but you have to come in and you have to be able to see past behavior. You have to be willing to uh, not let, allow them to push your buttons. You have to be willing to see past that behavior that is manifested with a very trauma-based. Um, our sex offender unit, many of our young men in there have been um, exploited in the pornography system. They've been sexually abused themselves. And if you come in and, you, and, and that, your own prejudice, if you're not really using a lot of self-reflection and being able to deal with people without allowing them to move you, then this is just not the job for you. It, 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 it takes a lot, a lot of compassion, but it also takes a lot of limit setting. And if you're there to change people on your own, you're going to burn out real quick. You really have to go in with um, the mindset of helping them change, helping them find their, their place, and um, just encouraging them and helping them build that self-efficacy that they don't have because they were raised um, without families and the trauma. Most of them are very trauma setting, so you have to really set limits with them. And it's difficult to, to set limits with um, some of these people. It starts out uh, at 3400 a month, so the, the pay is, is pretty good if you're interested in working. There's a lot of room to move up. There are a lot of uh, supervisory positions and counselor positions that go above the security level. Um, one thing that's changed quite a bit that is uh, very appealing, that would be appealing to you, is that we used to work in units with 25, 30 kids, and now there are only 12 kids on a unit with two staff members. So the ratio has changed safer. It's a lot safer now than it used to be. Um, as those of you that were here last week, the DOC director was discussing how seclusion is, is going away. That's um, a good thing in a lot of ways because secluding people that it doesn't help them change a lot, but unfortunately that means we can't seclude, seclude that 1% that um, can be very violent at times, which again um, presents a lot of challenges. So uh, if you're interested, I can also have brochures and I have cards and we'd love to have you. As an intern, you come in and you work in the control center for the first few months because uh, you're not really supposed to be around the kids until you've been exposed a while. And then you would never have to be involved in restraints or anything like that. You would just be doing it. The, the control center is our hub. So you essentially see everything that's going on and it will give you a feel um, as to if you, if you want to take this. So you would stay there, and the benefits is you get to make your own hours. So it's we're 24-hour residential, so you can get your hours in anytime. Um, you're exposed to all the evidence-based um, practices, the, the state initiatives. Excellent learning opportunity because uh, these trainings are, are are presented pretty often, and you're always welcome to come in and, and join us with those trainings. So there there are a, a whole lot of opportunities. Mr. Martinez brings people in occasionally for tours, so you're always welcome to come in for a tour and check that out. Uh, again, we're a transition facility, so after kids have been there about six months, if they're safe to be in the community, which about 80% of our young men are, we start transitioning them into uh, jobs and college and uh, just stay beside them, and that is, that is key. And if, if you're really interested in having a, a part,
We actually have six openings right now, so a lot of activities taking place. We are averaging for Canyon City, Canyon City officers, 100 calls of service per day for a collective for everybody. So if anyone's familiar with Canyon City, that's that's kind of keeping the, the time clock rolling for that many officers. There's a nodding head in the background. I appreciate that. So um, what do the job duties of our interns look like? Well, we're going to put you in the records division. Uh, crime, uh, crime prevention. We have a crime-free program with landlords and tenants that we're working on. Community outreach. Uh, our national night out this past year was our third one. Uh, we submitted for uh, the awards again. We're, we're two-year award winners in a row on a national level. So, um, and our interns play a vital role in our success in doing that. So it's very important that you understand that you're going to get in, involved in that. Right now, uh, we're getting ready for Boo at the Bridge, at the Royal Forge Bridge, which is coming up in October. I guarantee you, if you want to get on board to be an intern, you're going to be involved in, in that function. Last year, I just talked to uh, Troy Wold up at the bridge last night. They had over 2,000 people arrive for Boo at the Bridge. So this is a great, uh, it's, it's kind of like the old trunk or treat, but there's, there's kind of an evolution. They've got professional makeup artists and stuff like that doing that. Um, you're going to be doing surveys on our department and the personnel. So as you're, as you're uh, making some phone calls or visiting folks, you're actually going to find out what we as the Canyon City Police Department can do, and then you're going to offer suggestions for our improvement. And we're going to be very candid in how we receive that information. So you are, in essence, uh, a vital role in how we improve our services to the Canyon City community. Attending city meetings is another big thing. Um, I, I take interns a lot to uh, Bar Owners Association meetings, uh, the Homeless Coalition that, that has been formed down there. So there's a lot of different things that you're going to get involved in that's uh, not just inside the walls of the building. We're going to get you out, uh, get you outside. But you're going to have your own office. You're going to have your own computer. You're going to have your own phone. And we've got your nice little, nice little area set up. It's a very big office. Um, it's actually bigger than mine. I don't know how we did that, but uh, it's, it's all good. I have a window. So um, there is no residency requirement. So for those of you that might be worried that there's a residency issue, don't sweat it, okay? It's not a big deal. You do have to have a driver's license. And uh, there's a requirement that you can't have been arrested for something, all right? Because some of the sensitive nature of the things that we're going to have you do. Um, here's kind of a neat part. When we start talking about hours, I know when we're in college, hours, time, is very important to every one of us. So what kind of flexibility are we going to have? Our interns have the ability to work from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Well, let's say that your schedule only allows you to work maybe 8 to, 8 to 11 one day, or maybe 2 in the afternoon until 5 in the afternoon. We're going to give you that flexibility. That's huge. Uh, that's tremendous for you. It's tremendous for us because then all we're asking for is some consistency. So, you know, if, you, if this is your schedule, let's try to keep, keep with it and then, uh, you know, we can kind of schedule a few weeks in advance. So it's definitely a good thing to do. Um, another huge thing, the internship does not have to coincide with the semester. Does anybody feel that could benefit them at all? You know, kind of get outside the semester, see a few naughty heads. Uh, that, that's a big deal, okay? Um, the way it works is every intern is going to receive a primary assignment from the chief of police, and then you're going to get multiple, uh, multiple secondary assignments that are worked on, worked on with team members from the department and other interns. So if you know somebody that's an intern, you might be paired up on a project uh, along with something maybe that I'm doing in regards to crime prevention or something to do with the cameras uh, for downtown Canyon City as far as trying to e evolve some programs or stand up some programs we're trying to kick off. So it's, it's, it's kind of a neat idea. Uh, you will have to have an interview with the chief uh, if you have a pencil and paper. The, the interviews are set up by the administrative assistant, Valerie Laney, and her name spelled is L-E-H-N-E. -E. Her phone number is 276-5600, and her extension is 5247. So definitely get with Valerie uh, when you can. We've typically had about 20 interns in the past. Uh, my understanding is, is you're earning three college credits for 160, 160 clocked hours. And we currently, four college credits, okay, so that's, so there's, there's no information for me. And um, my understanding is, is we have currently three openings, is what Chief wanted me to relate to you today. So um, three openings is, is really big uh, when, it, when it comes to kicking off this time of the year. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? I'm making sure I can keep in touch with you, okay, thanks. Um, 
what kind of dress code are we looking for? You know, it was kind of comical. The chief's like, you know, business, business casual. And I said, come on, chief. You know, no, he's, a, he's actually telling us that uh, jeans that are in good repair are acceptable for what you're going to be doing. And, uh, and that's pretty acceptable. I mean, we, we have a pretty relaxed dress code. You're going to be issued a department ID. Uh, that will be returned at the end of your tenure as an intern. Uh, successful interns have been receiving letters of recommendation from the chief upon completion of the, inter of the internship. And I think one of the biggest things that we're really proud of is, is the family type attitude that we have. So, I mean, if you're in college and you don't have a lot of family around, you're going to benefit from going to the bowling, going bowling that we, that we do, going down and seeing the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, we've gone to some baseball uh, games up here in Colorado Springs as a group. So, I mean, it's, it's not just what you're trying to do as an intern, but, you know, you're really part of the family. You're going to see that uh, once you get on board because you're going to be, you're going to have your hands in everything. Literally, you're going to have your hands in everything. Uh, you could be out on a, uh, an emergency vehicle operation course as a flag person. Um, you might be down doing some time with the investigators. It's whatever the needs of the department is at that time is where the chief's going to place you. So, uh, sky's the limit as far as a, a small department. And not to mention, we are only 35 miles away. It's a nice scenic little drive on 115 to come see us. So, I mean, if you want to try to coordinate your time to make that work, um, we really appreciate it. I don't have any brochures, but I will be remaining afterwards. If anybody wants to come up to me and make that happen, again, I want to remind you that to uh, Mike Martinez that's on my left over here, he's the guy that can make this happen for you real quick. Um, the process goes very fast. We can literally, if you, if you make a phone call a month on a Monday, we can literally have you in the police department on a Friday, as long as your schedule is open enough to get in and see the chief. So, uh, and that's benefited us to be a smaller agency to have that speed to make that happen, okay? One uh, footnote on that, if you do decide to go with Kansas City Police Department, I've got to give you a warning. You travel that highway, you travel the speed limit. <laughs> with the numerous tours that I've taken students on to Kansas City, the last thing I tell students before we leave, watch your speed. First thing I see on the highway, the student's car stop the street. So Brandon, I don't know how many times you traveled to Kansas City from the office here, but the speed limit is, is uh, something to be followed. So again, Kansas City is an excellent place, but just be careful with the speed if you go. I don't pay the tickets. The students. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to just step over here because I can't see everybody's face from my corner there. So. Uh, let me start out and give you a quick introduction to myself. My name is Brandon Davis. I work for the uh, Colorado Department of Corrections. I'm here representing only one part of corrections today, and uh, that's the Office of the Inspector General. I'll give you a little background on myself. I'm the UCCS class of 98. Um, some of you were just probably barely born back then, but that's okay. Um, uh, back then, the mascot here was the Long Necks. Um, they was a draft, but the nickname was the Long Necks. They decided to change that because the whole beer connotation. So there was no dorms at that point. It was a commuter campus until my second to last year. It became a dorm campus. So a lot has changed uh, since I've been here. I actually had an opportunity fairly similar to this through the program that I was in where I picked up a um, uh, paid research assistant position that was in a um, research project that was going on in DOC. Before I graduated, I had a full-time job with this company, and then it was eventually my foot in the door into corrections. So within um, the, the program, actually, the grant that was funding in this program was, was um, basically drying up at the end of a year, and within about two weeks of that grant uh, drying up, I actually had a job with the DOC, so, and have been there since. So uh, if anybody here has had a class with Kelly Cleavy or knows who Kelly Cleavy is, uh, we can blame her for being in the DMC, like I often do on the bad weeks. So, like I said, the most important thing about that is that um, we had the opportunity, to, or you coming into, you'll see how the opportunity to many different um, jobs. We, basically every job that is in society, we have in corrections. Um, like I said, I'm not representing that today, I'm only representing our, our investigations and our intelligence unit. I started as a uh, crime analyst within our unit, I later proceeded to become a supervisor. Uh, I am currently a senior intelligence analyst as well as a crime analyst, and I supervise two programs in our department, our uh, drug deterrence program, 
which is our, our staff and offender uh, drug programs, as well as our background check, our CCIC, NCIC program. I supervise that. We have over 700 CCIC operators who are the larger agencies in the state, so that also comes out of our area. Give you a little bit of background on DOC. We currently house about 23,000 offenders within the walls, and we supervise about 10,000 families across the state. Out of those offenders, um, we are looking at approximately 8,000 of them that are involved in what we call security threat groups, also known as gangs. I'll use those interchangeably. We, in our unit, if you want to look at what our unit is, um, or at least at, at, I should say our office, our office is like the detective branch of DOC. You know, we look at all of our correctional series as our law enforcement, and we look at the Office of the Inspector General as our detectives bureau, basically. We employ 33 post-certified investigators in our department, and um, I think about 20, 24 additional support staff, including myself, uh, in, also in our unit. So what we do currently in our unified intelligence team is we manage to uh, track all the different gangs, the offenders involved in that gang, the activity that goes along with that, the reporting that comes from the facilities in the streets, uh, security alerts, all that. Our purpose is for the prevention of gang activity. It's not illegal to be in a gang. It's not something we can prohibit in our system, but the activity that goes along with it and uh, monitoring that for the safety and security of everybody is the ultimate goal of our, our unit. So I will tell you right now, we are currently, um, we have two interns with us, both master's level, that are, are working on finishing theirs up. One has enjoyed it so much that she stuck around and is doing some volunteer time even after her hours. We are looking at two uh, current openings. I will say they are unpaid positions at this point. We've been trying to figure out money to get that, but it's a little bit tough in the state system. So what uh, you guys would be doing in that position, there's, there's two purposes. One, we've just recently programmed a um, uh, intelligence management, a game management system internally. And what we're trying to do is to convert from our old legacy system into our new system, as well as creating departmental, official departmental records on some of our bigger games. So our current interns have done background and uh, interviews and gone out to the, the, the FBI, other agencies, gone out to uh, local law enforcement and developed this, uh, you know, what the official game record is that we would testify to in court. So they got a chance to do a lot of background work, contact a lot of agencies, and um, uh, you know, get to know about games. So I, I do believe, I think they have done during their time uh, four or five different games, motorcycle groups, and um, some of the uh, uh, transnational games that we have going on right now. So that would be something that would continue on, like I said, in addition to the, the data conversion. So the other thing that we offer is we give you the opportunity to tour facilities. So we will, one of our staff will take you to facilities, we will take you to our highest level security, to our oldest facility uh, down in Canyon. We will also take you up to Denver to see the intake process, which is something that nobody gets to see in any tour capacity, no general public gets to see how the intake process works. Um, we also use that as an opportunity for you to write experiential papers, if that is something that you have to do, and write about a, you know, an observation, similar like to write along with the police department, that would be kind of like a ride along with me up to to our reception unit in Denver and get to see that process. Unfortunately, we had to get started a little early in the morning, but I'll give you plenty of work on that. Um, other opportunities that, that we have is just by coming into DOC, you have the ability to, to find out and to get introduced to people that might be in an area that you're more interested in that doesn't actually offer a uh, internship or a volunteer opportunity. Some of our smaller units, victim services, uh, we have like restorative justice type area. That's one of those, they don't, they, they're one, small units, but they don't also offer internships, but we can at least get you introduced to them and uh, hopefully get you started on a career in DOC. Um, let's see what else I got on here. Um, what we also do is we'll allow you to uh, be part of our, our management process, what we do with gang offenders, how we deal with uh, interviewing them, uh, when they want to leave a gang, what we call our, our you know, a debriefing process. You'll get to see our management process of what we do when a guy has turned on his own gang and now we've got to protect him for the rest of his life, however long that may be. Um, sorry, that's kind of weird there. But, you know, the reality is these guys put themselves in a bad situation and it is our responsibility to keep them alive. So that, that does make it difficult sometimes. 
but you'll get to see that process again, not something that the general public sees. And uh, one thing I will say is if you are able to clear some time on Friday, we do a uh, one Friday a month, we do our joint intelligence meeting where we bring in all of our facilities, and then once every quarter we bring in law enforcement from across the state, and we do an intelligence uh, meeting with training and sharing of all the intelligence across the state. So that, that's a good opportunity if you can free up time for that. Uh, one thing I will say, similar to everybody else, we do have a background investigations process that is required. As our unit is the unit that does those backgrounds, we can process that through usually a day or two. Um, that does require some paperwork, that does require, again, uh, no felony convictions, no recent arrest, no current probation, um, and no current visiting or communication with offenders that are in our system. So if you're currently visiting somebody, that's just not going to be possible because of the sensitive nature of what you do in our system. Um, if you know somebody that's in prison, that does not exclude you. I had somebody come up afterwards and say, oh, my cousin's in prison. I don't really talk to him. That's okay. That happens. We can't pick our family. That kind of stuff happens sometimes. So we will do that process. And again, as, uh, as the sergeant mentioned, um, if approved through Mr. Martinez and all that, we can have you in an internship uh, opportunity very, very quickly. Our location is going to be at Fountain Academy here in Springs, so not too far away. And uh, our hours anywhere from 7.30 to 5.30 Monday through Friday, and so we will work around your schedules. We let you set your own schedules. We may have to work with you. We have, we have two um, workstations, and again, like the sergeant, they're bigger than my office, um, so they, they have more room to, to stretch out. We have two, and so if we have more than two interns at any one point, then we may have to have you guys work around each other's schedules, but for the most part, you can make your own. So that's one more nice thing we have to uh, for freedom of that. So again, um, if you guys are interested, I'm going to put some contact information. Uh, Mr. Martinez does have all that, but I'm going to give it to you mainly if you have any additional questions about the process and uh, if, if you want to decide if this is the, the right internship for you. I'll give you my information. Again, it is Brandon, B-R-A-N-D-O-N, dot Davis, at State. Dot co dot us. Uh, my phone number is 719-226-4615. So thank you everybody for your time. <laughs>
unique opportunity. As you look at it, there's different aspects. You've heard of all the different areas of where they are, whether it's youth or we're talking about Homeland Security or even law enforcement, etc. cetera. Uh, ours is kind of a, if you will, an intervention kind of a mode that we get into. And we are a private not-for-profit, have been in business here in Colorado Springs for over 33 years. So uh, hopefully we're pretty good at what we do. We hope we are. Uh, and we think it's a unique situation for people if you come and work with us. Or some people mention tours. If you have an opportunity to come on a tour, that's a great idea because our unique setting would be a little different than some of the other things that you're seeing with these folks. Uh, in terms of just a little background for me, just give you the idea of passion for the work. I've been with uh, Concord for 26 years. Uh, the average manager with Concord has been with us almost 15 years. Uh, the average supervisor has actually been with us about 12 years. And uh, uh, the one thing where we do experience the turnover is kind of that first level positions. I think case managers will be about seven years. Eight years for case managers. Our basic uh, security position is one where people can kind of come in and cut their teeth. So a lot of them end up going to work for a lot of them after they've had a little exposure. So it's a great place to get used to working with criminal offenders in, a, in kind of a unique, non lockdown, but yet secure kind of facility. So and I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn over to my partner, Liz, here, and she will kind of talk about some of the mechanics of how the internship works and how you apply. My name is Liz Aragon, and to, for our internships, we have both undergraduate and graduate level. Uh, for the undergraduate, we kind of start you at the lower level, the correctional side of it, to make sure it really is what you're thinking uh, corrections is all about. We start you out doing more of the, uh, the paperwork, the breathalyzers, do your analysis. You go in with a staff member, make sure, well, this is this really what I think I want to do? Um, paperwork, that type of thing. Then after a few weeks of kind of cutting your teeth into this and you sure you really want to do that type of a, a atmosphere, then we kind of work you into the case management side of housing. Um, you will shadow your case, another case management, and kind of do some case planning, um, do a little bit more paperwork, do get uh, used to some of the LSI scores, the treatment scores, TRXWs, that type of, let's see, um, the, the, to see how your, or where to put your clients for um, treatment purposes. Um, to, to figure out where your client is best suited for their criminogenic needs. Um, we want to see on both sides of the house, the correctional and the, the placement of the, the client. Um, if you make it through your entire uh, internship, there's a little bonus at the end of it. You do have to be screened for our internships. It's not just a direct placement. Uh, there is a paid bonus at the end of it. It's a small bonus, but it is a paid bonus. Uh, you do have to commit to at least five hours a week uh, for the internship. We are a 24-7 program, so uh, the flexibility of your schedule work around classes, we can work in your schedule 24-7. It's very easy saying, ah, I can't work this day, this day, this day, but I can work these nights or these early mornings, we can work with your schedule. That's a bonus when you're trying to work around your guys' work schedule and school schedules. Again, you do have to be screened, you do have to pass a background check. We have three separate background checks, which you do have to pass in misdemeanors, depending on what they are. Or different situation. If you are interested, you can contact me by giving the, my card here or my email is L A R A G O N at C O M C O R dot O R G. And two other things, um, I don't know if you challenge this, but we're the closest to you because we're right now in Nevada here. So if you're looking for something convenient with school, we're, we're not even. 10 minutes away. Uh, and the last thing was is just to give our website, which is, is comcor.org. And you can look at that. We have some information about the company, etc. And then also, uh, eventually, if you're interested, that's where the application process happens. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Thank you.
So, um, my name is uh, Eric Grosskopf, and I'm Tyler Cooks, um, and we are with Colorado Springs Teen Court. Now, we are an unusual organization in the sense that we are an independently owned and operated nonprofit organization, but what we technically are is an alternative sentencing program for first time juvenile misdemeanor offenders. We get them as young as 10 years old and as old as 18 or 19 in certain cases. Um, they receive six months deferred sentences with us. And the cool part about our program is that we are all based on restorative justice and all of the teenagers in the program are sentenced by other teenagers. So in addition to the 400 or so defendants that we see every year, we also have about 180 to 200 student volunteers that come down to municipal court where we're based out of. And they sit on what are called peer panels. And that's where we take three to six of our student volunteers, put them in a courtroom with an adult case manager. As an intern, you will have the opportunity to be a case manager at peer panels. And we bring the kids and their parents or guardians into the courtroom. We swear them in. Then we have mom or dad step out. The panel talks to just the kid for a little bit, get to know them a little bit better. And then when they finish with the kid, they bring the parent in and they get input from them. And then as a panel, the student volunteers decide the most appropriate sentence based on what that kid needs. Um, the more serious cases that we see are put on a teen court trial, um, which are handled by our student attorneys and student bailiffs. We have real lawyers and real judges from here in the community that volunteer their time to come down and help our student volunteers with this. It's conducted just like a criminal trial would be, um, except the cool part about the trials is the jury is made up of former offenders, because one requirement of every teen court defendant's sentence is to come back and serve a teen court jury duty. So we give them the opportunity to sit on the other side of the table. And let me tell you, they get into that. They turn into 12 angry men. It's awesome to see them getting so invested in helping the next kid. Um, in addition to the jury duty, um, Tyler, what else do we have to get to? Um, community service is also a requirement of uh, teen court sentence. Uh, we also host a uh, myriad of classes uh, that include a community impact panel for all the shoplifting cases, an alcohol and drug panel for all of our alcohol and drug cases. Um, all of our high school defendants go through a life skills class uh, we also have a straight talk class, which is uh, taught by uh, former offenders or uh, kids that are currently housed in Spring Creek that come down uh, or that are brought down to um, talk to some of our youth that are going through the program. We also have a Empower class, which is for our uh, younger male defendants who don't necessarily have a positive male role model in their life, and that's taught by um, a agent with the DEA um, who had a rough upbringing. We also um, refer out to many agencies uh, around the community, uh, like the Women's Resource Agency teaches one of our classes, uh, a uh, motion-based therapy class uh, called Colorado Motion. So those are some of the things that are included in uh, teen court sentence, but um, they are all individualized to fit that kid's needs um, as they're going through their first experience through the court system. And where the program is so effective with these kids, again, they're first time misdemeanor offenders. So a big chunk of these kids, after you sit down and you start talking to them, you can tell this was the first time they've ever had an encounter with the law like this. Uh, we see a whole lot of defendants that are in court because of the result of peer pressure, because of the wrong group of friends, wrong place, wrong time. And uh, sheer stupidity. Yes, and sheer downright utter stupidity. And they will tell us that when they finish that. You know, they'll come back and say, wow, that was the dumbest decision I ever made. Um, the light at the end of the tunnel for all of our kids, though, after they've completed their sentence, and again, it's all based on restorative justice, which focuses heavily on taking accountability for your actions and owning up to what you did. That's why in order to get into the program, they have to plead guilty and receive that six-month deferred sentence. So before they even see us, they're already starting that process. It also focuses on competency development. We want these kids to learn from their mistakes so they ultimately don't go out and do it again. And we also focus a lot on community safety and ultimately repairing the harm that was done because we want these kids to understand that they're part of a larger community. It's not just them and their parents and their tiny little world. A lot of these kids act very impulsively. They don't live more than 15 minutes ahead of themselves. But the light at the end of the tunnel for them is if they complete their sentence successfully in the six months that we have them, they can get their charges dismissed and then as long as they stay out of trouble for a year, they can apply to get their records expunged so they don't have this dumb decision following them around on their records for the rest of their lives. 
Um, currently, the reoffense recidivism rate for our defendants is only 7%. And it starts from day one when they sit in front of their literal actual teen peers. Because, I mean, who better to tell a teenager to stop making dumb decisions than another teenager? So, I mean, in addition to the defendants that you as an intern will get to uh, interact with directly, we are constantly calling them, reminding them to come to classes, um, reminding them to turn stuff in. I've noticed this, that the boys seem to have more of a problem with that than the girls as far as if you finish something, you need to turn it in so we know that you did. So, we have to remind them of that. Um, like I said, you'll be able to be a case manager when we have peer panels. Um, when you're in the office, there are only four of us on staff. So we rely so much on our interns, and it's more than just, you know, making copies and getting coffee. It's not that. All the stuff that we do when we don't have interns is the stuff that you guys get to do. Um, we, there's four of us managed between four and 600 kids a year. Um, so in addition to over 200 student and adult volunteers as well. So we uh, rely heavily on our interns and our volunteers who are very valuable to us. Um, we currently have three open positions uh, for this current semester. Um, we generally carry about four uh, interns per semester. As far as um, applying, uh, you'll go through Mike Martinez to uh, fill out the UCCS intern application. He sends it to me, I then get in contact with you, um, or you can contact me directly uh, along with Mike to get it set up. Uh, we get you down for an interview. Uh, you do have to submit to a background check. Um, misdemeanors, we can work with. Felonies, we don't work with, uh, unfortunately. Um, so that, that does exclude you, um, along with any um, sex offenses or child-based offenses. Uh, that excludes you from our program because we do work so closely with kids. Um, but I've got cards, Eric's got cards for you to get in contact with us. Uh, just a little bit of background on uh, he and I, three of the four staff that work at Team Court started as UCCS interns, uh, myself included and Aaron included. Uh, so it is a great opportunity. You get a lot of exposure um, to both kids and their parents, who can be a little ugly sometimes. But um, it is a great hands-on experience. We um, strive to make it very interesting for you. Uh, you do carry your own caseload of kids that are assigned to you um, that you track through the program and uh, try to make them as successful as possible um, even after they're outside of the program by making better decisions than what they were making. Um, so it's, it's a great experience for um, whatever uh, field that you want to go to within criminal justice. And something else that makes us, you know, again, we're a nonprofit organization, so we don't get any funding from the state, from the court. The only thing we get from municipal court is our teeny tiny little office in the probation department that's free of rent. Um, so all the money for the program that we have, the funding, the scholarships we give to the low income families that we see, um, we have to go out and find. So we have our defendant aspect, we have our volunteer aspect, and then we also have our nonprofit fundraising aspect. Um, we are actually uh, just getting ready to prepare for our fall fundraiser. Every fall, the first Friday in November, we have a holiday wine tasting. Um, and no, the kids are not at the event. I can't tell you how many people have asked me that. It is 21 and up only. Um, it's also my personal favorite fundraiser. Um, but then in the spring, we also have an annual luncheon as well. This last year, we had about 500 people come, including the mayor, the chief of police. Um, it was a great time. So with us being a nonprofit, we have to keep very detailed, very accurate statistics about absolutely everything, all the demographics of our kids and everything. So. Um, if you're detail-oriented, we would love to talk to you. And I promise you guys, you will never be bored. We cannot make up some of the stuff that these kids are doing. It constantly amazes us, you know, and they're not all bad kids. They're just being really, really dumb. Um, example, a couple years ago, we had a case involving seven boys, which as we all know, boys plus boredom plus summer equals stupidity. So they uh, decided to have a sleepover one night and thought it'd be a good idea to go around um, the neighborhood they were in and start stealing all of the milk that was delivered on people's front porches. After doing this for an extended period of time, they filled the entire back of one of these boys' pickup trucks with $700 worth of milk and dairy products. And what did they do with it? They didn't know what else to do with it. They took it to 
to a field and they dumped it all out in the field. So eventually they were all, they fessed up to it, they all essentially ratted each other out um, and they were all charged with theft. But we got them in there and in their peer panel. Very, very intelligent young men, good families, they all had plans, they all had future aspirations. <laughs> they were just being stupid and they understood that by the end of it. So part of their sentence, they had to do their community sentence, or I'm sorry, their community service with uh, the dairy company that got a lot of angry phone calls the following morning with people saying, what happened to my milk? I need to feed my children, you know? So um, these are the kinds of kids we work with. Um, and like Mr. Martinez was saying, um, with this internship, I had to do it. I graduated here about six years ago. Um, but where he knew he wanted to get into corrections, I knew I had to do an internship. But I had no idea where to go or what to do with that. So I encourage you with all the fine agencies that are up here, um, you might be fortunate like me and like Tyler. Um, you come in, you get some experience, and then you find a passion for something you never even realized you had. And if you get lucky, they'll throw a job at you and they'll keep you like they did with you and I. So. And then it turns into an addiction. Yes. <laughs> you get addicted to working with these kids. And some of them actually, when they finish, they come back and volunteer with us. And those are some of my favorite volunteers because they turn into fearless leaders. It's great. So, um, if you want to learn more about our program, our website is www.springsteencourt.org. Um, and Tyler and I will be here afterwards to um, answer questions. Um, you can email him. It's uh, T-Y-L-E-R at springsteencourt.org. I know it's the longest email address ever. So um, if you're unable to stay all the way to the end, um, shoot me an email if you have any questions. I'll be more than happy to answer whatever you have, and Eric and I will be sticking around till the end. Yeah, and my email is Eric, E R I C K, at springsteencourt.org. Either of us would be happy to talk more about it. We could tell you stories for days about these kids. So, thank you for having us, Mr. Martinez. Thank you again for joining us.
and uh, have just a few slides to show you, and I'll talk a little bit about the information, and then be happy to answer questions. I also want to point out Officer Ray Isaac from Colorado Springs Police Department. He is the department's recruiter. So for those of you that are interested a little bit beyond the internship in a career in law enforcement, especially with the city of Colorado Springs, please take a minute to talk to Officer Isaac before you leave today, and he'll be able to help give that information to you as well. It's good to see some familiar faces in the room already. Okay, multitask, and here we go. I want to just start off by mentioning when you talk with uh, Mike Martinez and Rod Walker about an internship with Colorado Springs Police Department, you may see or hear this acronym, CAPS, the CAPS program, Community Advancing Public Safety. That is the volunteer program for the police department, but it's also the portal for internships. So all of the paperwork is such that you see, if it doesn't say Colorado Springs Police Department on it, don't be concerned, you're still in the right spot. This just happens to be where the internship program is held. The Colorado Springs Police Department uh, essentially has several bureaus. There's over a thousand employees. It's about two-thirds sworn, one-third civilian. Internships are placed in both the sworn and civilian ranks. So whatever is of interest to you, we'll try and align you to your field of study the best that we can with those openings as they come up as well. And here are the bureaus that you see. We have our Operations Support Bureau. And this is where we'll find a lot of our investigations, detectives, um, our crime lab, our evidence, etc. We have our Patrol Bureau. Those are the officers that are out in our four substations that you see in the patrol cars. When they are at their stations, they have work as well, and we do assign interns to them as well. Um, as part of the intern program, you'll be asked to do, um, from our end, you'll be asked to do two officer ride-alongs and one civilian officer ride-along, and that will fall under the patrol bureau. So I think we can answer a few questions on that if you'd like. And then we also have our professional standards division. That's our community outreach, our accreditation standards, and our community relations team, which um, Officer Isaac dual hats. It's not like he gets to just do one task, it's CSPD. So he's also out of our community relations team as well. As I mentioned, our Operations Support Bureau has uh, our investigations divisions, and these are generally really good places for our volunteers. At the end of our intern, excuse me, our interns, at the end of the intern program, we do have an evaluation form we'll ask you to fill out, and we get really good remarks back from our interns that the experience was a positive and meaningful one for them. And that is to help our detectives work cold cases in our Crimes Against Elders Unit, our Victims Unit, and our Financial Crimes Unit, just to name a few. A lot of the assignments are with sergeant level and above, as well as detectives. We also have a specialized enforcement unit, and under that is the municipal court. You heard the gentleman from Teen Court talk about where they're housed. That's actually in the municipal court system, and we also have law enforcement there, and we do assign interns in that role as well because of the very broad exposure they get working with other agencies, working with the court system, and working with the criminal justice center staff. I mentioned in our patrol bureau, in those four subdivisions, uh, in there are the four quadrants of town, if you're not from Colorado Springs or familiar with it, we have four substations. One is on the northwest side of town by Chapel Hills Mall, our Falcon Station. Our Stetson Hill Station is on the northeast quadrant by Sky Sox Stadium. The southeast quadrant is the Sand Creek Division, that's just south of the Citadel, Citadel Mall. And then we do have the Gold Hill Station on the southwest side, and that's just um, slightly out of downtown off 8th Street. So those are the four substations where our patrol bureaus are housed. We have a property crimes detective in each one of those, and we have a crime prevention officer in each one of those, among many other officers. But those are areas where we have done intern assignments that have been really meaningful work as well. I also want to point out the surveillance camera program. I heard that mentioned by one of the other speakers, I think, from Canyon City. Uh, downtown Colorado Springs also has surveillance cameras along the Tejon Street corridor. 
And part of the surveillance that is done through those cameras in direct communication with the foot patrol officers is done out of our Gold Hill station. And those camera monitors are staffed by um, interns. We've had quite a few interns come through because it's such a great broad experience in terms of you're working with the comm center, making dispatch calls for service. You're on your cell, on the cell phone talking to the officers who are out on foot patrol, helping them because you're their eyes and ears. And you're also working with police radio. So you can interpret in all of that. We need people proficient in technology and comfortable with it. And I'm guessing this audience is, is pretty well with that. The interns we've placed there have said it's an amazing experience. You're working hand in hand with the detectives, the officers, etc. You're working with four different monitors. You're watching about 15 cameras at any one time in addition to the other technology I mentioned. Really quite fascinating. And again, we've placed a lot of interns here who've given us some very positive feedback. Okay, here's our process. And um, in contrast to some of what you heard from some of the other folks, ours is a little lengthier. If you're considering an internship to start out your semester in January, we need your application almost now, certainly by October. Our MTA process is a background and records check like you've heard from many of the other agencies. You will be fingerprinted and you'll go through an in-person interview. The disqualifiers in our process are felony conviction and any drug use, any illegal drug use to include marijuana in the prior 18 months. Those are automatic disqualifiers in our process and I know that Rod Walker and Mike Martinez have that information to share with we also do require all interns to go through a polygraph. Not only because of the nature of the work I described in some of the units that I talked about earlier, but it's also an experiential learning for you if you are considering a career in law enforcement. So those are our screening um, steps. We do have a student checklist that we provide you to just help you to walk you through all those steps so that again, for the visual learners in the room, you have that in front of you. And on that checklist are the two officer ride-alongs I mentioned and the civilian officer ride-along because you'll get entirely different perspectives on both of those. Capacity, our numbers are flexible. We are able to accommodate based on officer um, availability. Sometimes we can take two to three interns a semester and sometimes we can take eight to ten. It really is driven by the workloads of the officers and the detectives. They take as many as they can because they genuinely believe that by providing this experience to you, it's going to not only help you in your academic endeavors, but your future career choices, you know, that you want to talk to Officer Isaac about. And in fact, quite a few of the tech detectives where we place interns came through as interns themselves and got hired on. So they get it. So just to recap, I, I'm not sure in the prior conversations, I apologize, I came in a little late. Our interns, internships are unpaid, and yes, they are for academic credit. That's why we're here today to tell you about that. And then again, just to restate, there is the information on the disqualifiers in our process. There's the contact info if you care to jot it down, and I also have these cards with me, and I know Officer Isaac has some information as well about the internship bridging into a possible recruit for the academy. Can I answer any questions for you at this point? Okay, thank you for having us.
campus is actually about 10 minutes away from here, um, near the uh, Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame off of Mark Dapp Boulevard. Um, we have internship opportunities that are unpaid. Uh, I'll read through the bunch of the documents here because it's, there's a lot of detail. Uh, as far as the activities you'll be doing, there's the administrative side of the house and the operational side of the house. Um, some of the duties you may be uh, asked to do are data entry, categorizing paperwork and some PowerPoint presentations. As far as the operational side, um, monitoring trackers that we place on our suspect vehicles, uh, monitoring pull cameras that we have on our target locations, target residences, doing some redacting, which is part of our discovery process, doing some light telephone tool analysis on our target phones, participating in demand reduction, which is much like their program that we have in uh, different local areas. We also have the opportunity to observe some courtroom testimony, uh, some discovery, uh, preparation for prosecution, and also assisting special agents in the collection of evidence. As far as the qualifications that are required for the TGA internships, you have to be enrolled University, which you are here, must be a full-time student as opposed to a part-time student, must be in good academic standing, with the, the college have a 295 GPA overall, must be 18, this is limited to the folks who are in their junior or senior year, um, never been convicted of any felony or crime of domestic violence, and never used any illegal drugs beyond experimental use of marijuana. As far as the contact information for those who are interested in with internships with DEA, it's our contact in Denver is Kim Setchfield, and she can be reached at 720-895-4151. As far as the application process, um, there's a number of things that need to go in the application process for the internships. One is a cover letter outlining your interest in the program, um, also a resume, transcripts, um, current enrollment, your class schedule that you have, the letter of enrollment, uh, which is um, on school letter that showing that you are being enrolled in, in UCCS. There's going to be a drug use questionnaire as well as a DEA volunteer service agreement. Let's see, as far as the Enrollment, the process to become an internship is a lengthy one. I'm a recruiter with DEA. Our hiring process is roughly a year. Uh, given the nature of work that we do, the internship program, there is a, a lag as far as when you apply, as far as when you come on. It's roughly about four or five months to accommodate our background investigation that we run. Uh, so for those who are interested, if you're looking for a summer internship, you have to apply by January. If you're looking for a fall internship, you have to apply by May. If you're looking for a spring internship, you have to apply by September. So, if you have any more if you'd like some more information as far as what the DEA does, as far as an agency, uh, you can get with me after this session or the easiest way is just go on to DEA.gov. Public affairs. Where? Public affairs. It's on the school of public affairs. 
Affairs website. When you log on to the School of Public Affairs website, there's a link to academics. You click on that link, that'll take you to the BACJ program. Click on that, that'll take you to the internship manual. It'll take you to the UCCS BACJ internship application. And by the way, those applications must be typed. I got tired of squinting my eyes in my old age trying to figure out what somebody was saying. So they have to be typed. Now, if you're looking at CSPD, your CAPS application is on an additional link. The same with the sheriff's office. Same with probation. Same with the DA's office. Those applications are separate from the internship application, all of those have to be turned into me or to Mr. Walker. Don't send them directly to the agency. Now, on CSPD, if you log on to their website and pull up their caps, their application will be there. Do not send it directly to Jean. She's going to call me or Mr. Walker and say, hey, do you have the UCCS application? So it's better if we send them in for you. So once I receive your application, I will send it to the agency. Whether it's comp or team or parole next spring. I will send it to them with a letter asking them to consider you for an internship. Then you'll hear directly from that agency. Now, if you're looking at the spring internship, you won't get a registration number for that course until I get approval or Mr. Walker gets approval for you to do that internship. So if you're looking at your uh, Registration, say, well, I can't sign up for an internship. You won't be able to until you get the registration number from me. Now, the benefit to our internship program is that you can do more than one. You have to do a minimum of four hours, but you can do up to a maximum of eight hours. Now, for every credit hour, you have to put in 40 clock hours. So if you want to do an eight hour internship, you're looking at 320 clock hours. So keep that in mind. If you want to do one with Gwen at the, at the uh, DA's office, and then you want to see what the flip side of it is with the public defender's office, you can do it with them. If you want to go with the sheriff's office, you can do four hours with them, and then four additional hours with the police department. That gives you that option and opportunity. Probation, <coughs> four hours with the grade, four hours with parole. So you can do that if you want those, those additional four hours are electives, they're up a division, and they go towards your 120 credit hours that you need for graduation. So again, October 17th, Mr. Walker with CSPD and the Sheriff's Office may want you to do that earlier than that. But for me with the agencies, we should have enough time to get you approved by mid-January when you start courses for spring. You're looking at a summer one, I need those by the first part of April. Again, if you're looking at the federal agencies, when I went through my federal background check, I kept wondering, did they find something wrong with me? I have to earn month after month after month, four months later, I get a call back, we've got your FBI investigation here, looks good. Well, for a while I thought maybe they were thinking of somebody else. That's Again, the drawn out process. We're looking at the federal system. As Mr. Sanders said, you're looking at about four months, possibly five. So get those into that early. So is Penny Moore still there? She retired last she year. Retired. Oh, she was a great contact. So again, he's given us another contact person. Get with Kim. She'll let you know when the, uh, oh, she'll let you know, first of all, if there is an opening for an internship with the and if so, where? It may be in Denver, it may be here in Colorado Springs. So keep that in mind. With Mr. Slab, it's the same thing, uh, since it's a federal agency. One of the drawbacks has been recently with federal applications is the funding. They have to do the background investigation, and it's extensive. So again, if there's funding for it, there may be an internship available. So keep that in mind if you're looking at the federal agency. Now, you all pay for the background investigation, right? So 
You don't have to worry about that. Not with C Corp. Not with C Corp. C Corp. What's well, not with Nonprofit money. <laughs> um, it's $25 to process your background check with Team Corp. It's one piece of paper. It's in our internship application that you would get after completing Mr. Martinez's, and then he will send it to us, and then we will reach out to you. He will call you and schedule an interview, and then we can get it rolling from there. T Corp, by the way, is the first agency when I started here at the university that I signed up for an internship. They already had CSPD, but when I came on, that was the only internship we could do was through CSPD. So it's developed in the years that I've been here. I think Eric and Tyler. 